Hey, we're back uh, talking about polymers, and we're going to actually finish up lecture one today. One down, and about like 15 more <laughs> to go, um, and actually longer ones to come. But anyways, today um, we kind of finished up our discussion about intra versus intermolecular bonds. Remember, uh, just a brief intermolecular interactions, 1KT, dynamic, breakable, can be broken at room temperature, intra, much, much, much greater than you know, around 10, you know, 1 kT, usually around 10 to 200 kT. So this is what makes, makes soft matter, polymers, biomaterials, proteins, all those things you need. These weak but really important dynamical bonds that can be broken and reformed uh, really dynamically, and it causes all those polymer fluctuations and uh, everything that's unique and fun about studying polymers. Um, so one thing that we're, uh, we're going to kind of move forward into kind of a related uh, topic today, which is that... Um, we've looked at kind of the chemical backbone. Backbone. We know about intra and intramolecular interactions, but now we're going to look a little bit closer about that backbone, that atomic structure, that angstrom length scale structure, and talk about isomeric states of molecules and polymers. So, isomeric states are basically uh, we're going to talk about conformers and isomers. So they're uh, basically an isomer are molecules that are structure are compositionally identical. So same composition. Compositionally identical, but structurally distinct. Conformers are also compositionally identical, but they can related, be related by a, oh, this is poor timing, <laughs> by a rotation around the bonds. So bonds and polymers, um, they are very dynamic. So they could be, they could rotate, they could vibrate, they could again, they could, you know, shift positions and change. Um, and we'll see that um, rotation is much more likely. Uh, so when you have, for example, let's get into this right now. If I have my old friend polyethylene uh, right here, single bonds, rotations around kind of these single bonds. So having these, like these H rotate this way and this guy rotates this way. And the same thing with these guys here, rotations around a single carbon bond, like the twisting around here is very, very possible. Actually, it's like 10 to the 10 rotations per uh, second, I believe. Uh, so there's lo there's lots and lots and lots of rotations that are uh, possible. Actually, I think it's like 10 to the 10 per second. Um, so those rotations are very, very easy. But once you start to deal with double bonds, this drops to effectively zero. You cannot rotate around that double bond there. So um, we'll get into that in just a little bit. But I wanted to take a step back and why are we dealing with, or what's so distinct, like why do we care about isomers? Things that are compositionally identical but structurally distinct, I mean, they're compositionally identical. So our TG should be the same, everything else should be, you know, properties, they should all be the same, right? The answer is definitely not. <laughs> so this structural distinction, this like double bond versus a single bond has severe implications for um, how that material behaves and what the properties are and how they vary. One of the kind of really tragic examples of this um, isomers and how important it is that we study them is thalidomide. So does anybody know what thalidomide what it was? It was a drug in the, um, I think it was in basically like the 1950s or uh, I think at the very end of the 1950s. Um, it was given uh, to women to uh, ease basically morning sickness. Um, unfortunately, thalidomide is um, an isomer. And it is an, uh, there's kind of these two isomeric states. One, and they're kind of like, basically it's this mirror or an optical, you know, I, I, isomer. So basically, there's like a left-handed version and a right-handed version, just like in your mirror, right? Like you could look at your hand, like there's a left-handed, like right-hand like shape, right hand, left-hand shape. So there are these kind of mirror images of one another. So two different versions, two different isomers of thalidomide. One isomer would be is perfectly fine to ease morning sickness. The other isomer, uh, I can't remember if it was the left or right isomer, but anyways, it, it just, it's not uh, important for this discussion. The other isomer is a poison. So unfortunately uh, and tragically, some women that were given thalidomide uh, started having severe complications, pregnancies, death occurred. So, and it's just from this pure, simple, just this mere symmetry, this rotation, you know, again, it doesn't seem... Um, you know, you, it's hard to even imagine that uh, that it could cause like one kind of you know mere change in that you know molecular structure. That structural distinction can cause such a dramatic change in properties, but it did, and it was you know a really tragic situation. So that is why we're studying these isomers. That's why we're trying to figure out those compositionally identical. The difference in structure can lead to dramatically different properties. 
So we need to understand isomers, and we're going to see today how several isomers can lead to, you know, different properties. And fortunately for us, it's not um, uh, with some of the polymers that we're going to be dealing with. We're not going to be dealing with kind of some of these tragic consequences. But we want to be able to know those and then design against them. So let's go into the next page, and we're going to be talking actually before we get started there. So again, this is kind of just what I was saying the last time. Room temperature, thermal rotations around a double or triple bond, essentially zero. So we have several different types of isomers that we are going to be working with here. Um, and you can break them down into this nice uh, kind of table of isomeric states. So these are all the different types of isomers that we can kind of deal with. So geometric, and there, there's more classifications. Um, structural, sequence, uh, these are really important in terms of polymer properties. And we're going to kind of see and talk and look at those in a second. Um, actually, I'll draw them right now. Isotactic, get used to this diagram. Symbiotactic, there's some um, pattern to this. Atactic, completely random. Yep. So, uh, cis and trans, hopefully you've seen those before, but we'll get back to that in a second. But this is just a nice diagram that uh, kind of shows all the different types of isomers that you could uh, deal with. So, Let's look at some examples. So there's lots of different types of isomers. So let's look at just structural isomers or geometric isomer here. So dichloral ethylene. I think. So actually, let's go back to here. So this is our material here. So is this an isomer or is this a conformer? Let's add isomer or conformer. Now I'm going to draw another molecule or a pair, and let's see if you can answer that question. And then if it's what type. So C H H C H C three. Then C H H C H C H three. So now these two molecules, two sets, are they isomers or like? So what's the what's unique about these two guys and these two? Well, one thing we could say is that they're both compositionally identical. We have carbon-carbon, CLCL, HH. Carbon-carbon, CLCL, HH. That's what we're kind of dealing with here. So they're compositionally identical. Same thing here. Now the big question is, are they structurally distinct, which would make them an isomer, or are, can they be related around a rotation, around a, sing, around a bond? So we just talked about, right, that room temperature. Can we rotate around this double bond here? No. So this is essentially fixed. So we can't rotate around that double bond. So this molecule and this molecule, because of that double bond, not being able to rotate, these are structurally distinct. So what configuration is this, if you remember from chemistry, when your kind of unique functional groups are all on one side? Cis. And this is here, here. We have it trans across. So those are isomers as a geo, you know, if we look back, I'll look at our image here. They're isomers, they're geometric isomers, and they're cis and trans isomers. Amazing. <laughs> Knocked all that out in one problem. What about these guys? Are these structurally distinct materials? No, right? Because all I have to do is if I rotate around this bond here, I have, I could recover. These are identical. If I close your eyes, if I block my screen here uh, and cover everything, and if I flip these guys around, it's just a they they can be related by rotation so we don't have to worry about this guy or i mean we don't have to worry about it but it's uh this is not an isomer these are conformers so that is kind of uh again i think it's easier to kind of see these uh things isomers conformers iso different types of isomers when you look at kind of examples um so that is a geometric or structural isomer uh, so it is not a conformer so let's look at a different type of isomers called stereoisomers these have really strong implications in terms of how um, we look at polymers. So stereoisomers um, basically have, again, structurally, you know, they're isomers, so they're compositionally identical. But the way that they arrange, essentially, like their side chains uh, here, or kind of like those backbones, they can have different arrangements or tacticity. So usually polymers will have some side chain, or if you kind of look at like a group like, um, we'll look at a PMMA, which has like CH3s, and CH2, excuse me, CH2, eh, that weird, <laughs> erase this guy, CH2, CH3, so these long kind of side chains, so they can be arranged, like these pendant groups can be arranged at different tacticities. Let's look at, sure, uh, I presented a beautiful 
professionally drawn figure. Uh, actually, it's on this page over here. So let's actually go back to our lecture notes. So let's look at an example of a stereoisomer and texticity. So right here, one more page. Here we go. So when you look at stereoisomers, it's all about how that pendant changes in range. So isotactic is unique or kind of distinct because you see how the pendant chains are all on one side. They're completely, you know, either all on the top or all on the kind of the bottom, you know, wherever you're, you know, they're all arranged on one side. There's no kind of changes there. Syndiotactic, you see there is some kind of um, regular kind of structure. Another syndiotactic one could be like this. It could be three. Three up, three down, three up, three down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A tactic is completely random. So these are structural distinctions. How can this affect our polymeric properties, especially in the context of intermolecular interactions? Well, we saw last time that Van der Waals, Van der Waals interactions, the force decays as d to the minus six. So we want to, if we want to increase the strength of this, of the, you know, the mechanical properties of our polymers, we need to pack these polymers as tightly as possible because the force it decreases dramatically. So what are we going to do? We need to pack them tightly and arrange them, you know, uh, in the best way possible. Which of these three isomers can pack the most efficiently? It's isotactic, right? Because all the pendant groups are on one side. So I could stack, basically coming out of my, you know, board or out of the kind of window, I could stack them like this coming out. I could stack them like that going in. I could stack them on top of each other. They pack really, really well, really, really efficiently. This is going to lead to, again, larger TM, larger stiffness, et cetera, et cetera. What's going to be the next one that packs most efficiently? Well, syndiotactic, right? Because I could arrange like a brush like right here so that they don't interact, or I could kind of like stack them where this guy, the brush is right here and then right here. So they pack very, very efficiently. So again, high TM. A tactic, because of that random nature, and we, again, we can't have molecules overlapping. This is not going to pack as efficiently. The TM is going to decrease. Most likely, your stiffness will decrease as well. So those are stereoisomers. Uh, so that's a fun one, a fun tool that we have to work with uh, in terms of tuning mechanical properties and other types of properties of polymer, thermal properties, et cetera, et cetera. We've kind of shown this as well. Those examples. The last thing I want to talk about today is um, we've already talked about geometric isomers. Then go. Let's go back here. We've done geometric. Uh, there's also, uh, from the cis and trans confirmation, there's also this thing called sequence isomers. So when we talk about block copolymers, usually we'll talk about like an A functional block and a B functional block of two different types of polymers, and we can arrange them in different ways. So we could have just a pure A block, pure B block, or kind of a random copolymer network, or, you know, an A, A, a B, B, you know, a, B, whatever you want to kind of, you know, design and create. But um, these, again, are compositionally similar or compositionally identical, not similar, but they are structurally distinct. This full A block, this full B block versus the ABA, very, very, very different properties. And we'll see how that changes um, basically the uh, self-assembly of block copolymers. So uh, let's go and talk about the one last topic, which is rotational isomeric states. I love uh, talking about this because it brings up um, uh, lots of topics. So we just talked about conformers, right? Conformers can be related by kind of this rotation around that single bond. However, there are certain configurations um, that are more likely to be adopted than others due to, again, molecules do not want to overlap. So again, this is energy. Energy, where do we want to be? What's the most highly probable energy? Like, where do we want to be in energy? High energy or low energy? We want low energy. We want negative energy. So we want to be in state A. State A has the lowest energy. It's hard to see from this diagram, but that is your trans state. Uh, so when those molecules, these pendant groups, this, methyl, uh, this CH3, this methyl group, when they're as far apart as possible, those big bulky groups don't want to be next to each other. So they want to be as far as apart as possible. That's when we're in our kind of like pseudo trans uh, conformation. When we're overlapped, when they're right close to each other, that's in our kind of like eclipsed or almost like our cis, you know, confirmation here. Um, we don't like, uh, you know, or actually not cis, but they're the kind of eclipsed here. Also in our cis confirmation in C, they don't like to be there as either. Now there are these lower states called these, these we call these like Gauss plus, Gauss minus states uh, in B. 
um, where there's not a lot of distance, or not as much distance. Um, they're not as far apart as in the, the full trans conformation, but they're farther apart than C. So again, you see kind of this lower energy state. Um, this is really hard to visualize um, and draw out, but one of the beautiful things, again, to, I'm not a mathematical salesman, but uh, one of the beautiful things about Mathematica is you can look up these demonstrations. So this is the exact molecule, 2-butanol, that we're dealing with here. So you can see, actually, this is see, N-butane. N-butane, that was the molecule that we're dealing with. So we can look and see how those different conformations and those angles, and you can see where we're at in our kind of potential energy curve here. So you see, uh, if we rotate, and if we get these guys as far apart as possible, if we get into that trans state. Okay, let me zoom out quickly so we can see. But you could download this from the Mathematica website. So you can see as you rotate where we're at in terms of our energy. So if I scroll through here, here you can see we're in our, sorry, trans state, effectively, almost. So when they're across like this, you can see in those molecules, uh, let's see, let's just make this torsional angle. You can kind of see the rotation. So then we're at trans. I'm going to slow this down. Slow down. And now let's actually control this guy. Oh, Mathematica is it's running wild on me. But anyways, you could see as it goes through and moves through these rotations, and you can play around with this notebook, uh, how you can deal with, uh, ooh. Let me get this control. So we could see as, as we rotate, see here, they're not fully in the trans state, but again, there's some distance between those molecules apart from here and here. As we kind of rotate here, we could get to this almost cis-like conformation. Not cis, but like uh, right here. And then again, the low, the highest energy state is when we're eclipsed. We're in that full cis conformation right there. So gauche plus, gauche minus. But again, we just want to get those molecules further apart. Molecules do not want to be near each other. Here, we're in that almost full trans conformation. So we're happy in terms of our energy state. So uh, this is kind of the, yeah, exactly. Call it that eclipsed or, you know, they're still closer together. They're not in our kind of lower energy state. And then here is like that, that gauche, gauche plus, gauche minus. That might be a new term uh, for you to hear. But yeah, there's still some distance and they're farther apart than, uh, than in obviously that other confirmation. So that's kind of what rotational isomeric states are. So uh, as you rotate, there's different probabilities. We always, again, the, the key aspect here is we want to go to lower energy states. Those are going to be more probable. Um, so you can kind of think about that in terms of if there's a structure involved. Uh, if we want to see any uh, distinct properties of a particular conformation or, or a, a particular rotational isomeric state, uh, we, we need to kind of figure out, is it a probable state? So if you're trying to design a material, you want to kind of think about those probabilities, think about those energy. This energy landscape is a really nice idea, and we're going to come back to that a lot more. So that's your first kind of fun thing with Mathematica. You can download this and play around with it um, if you want uh, to kind of visualize this, but uh, we'll kind of talk about it in class today. Thanks. I'll see you next time. Bye.